Sega's arcade divisions always turned out some great titles. But as the boom of 3D polygonal games really began to take hold, they also began experimenting with new types of gameplay that really took advantage of their technology. We had been privy to racing games on enclosed tracks for years, and Sega was ready to open things up and add exploration to the mix. No longer would a small arena lock you in, and games like 1997's Harley Davidson and LA Riders gave you a massive area to roam around and explore. No longer stuck to a single road, you could choose how you got to your goal any way you wanted. They upped the ante with emergency call ambulance by adding not just multiple routes throughout a large city, but also the fact you were transporting dying patients in desperate need of help. That experimentation with open environments would take a similar evolution with 1999's Crazy Taxi. Sega AM3 wanted to make something that took place in a living, breathing world of congested roadways, pedestrians in parks, and a map consisting of tons of different routes to take. Sega was also keen on showcasing its new Naomi Arcade hardware with this game, not just so it could convince customers to play the coin-op, but also to establish just how close home ports would be on its Dreamcast. That home version was released less than a year later, and true to Sega's word, it was a nearly perfect clone of what you had been playing in the arcade. In this episode, we will be taking Crazy Taxi for a spin, talk a bit about what made it so much fun, and see if it's as good as you remember. I hope you guys enjoy my review of Crazy Taxi for the Sega Dreamcast. The arcade version of Crazy Taxi had been about as simple as a game could be. Your job is to pick up customers and take them from point A to point B within the time limit. Each fare is color-coded based on distance and difficulty. A red fare is close by and easy. A dark green fare is far away and difficult. An arrow above your car shows you the general direction of your destination and a countdown timer indicated how long you had to get there. Of course, the heavy traffic doesn't make anything easy, and since the city was designed to mimic San Francisco, there are plenty of places for wild jumps and tight turns. And that's where the tips come in. Pull off stunts, close calls, and get your fare to their destination quickly, and you get extra money in time. There's multiple cabbies to choose from, each with a different style ride. When the Dreamcast conversion was released, Sega wanted to do more than a bare-bones presentation of the coin-op so they included both the arcade map and a new original area to give you lots more to see and explore. These are represented in your menu by the arcade and original modes. Both these options can be played using the original arcade rules or what amounts to playing with a very limited time that depends on your performance. You can also play in 3, 5, and 10 minute matches that alleviates the strict arcade rules and allows you the freedom to play as you see fit. There is also the Crazy Box, which has numerous different events to challenge and hone your driving skills. These skills include things like the Crazy Dash, which is done by shifting into drive and immediately hitting the accelerator, or the Crazy Drift, which is accomplished by quickly shifting into reverse and then back into drive as you hit a sharp turn. These must be mastered to do well in the Crazy Box events, which can be quite difficult. The better you do, you also unlock more events and eventually, a new type of vehicle. Go straight. Yeah, yeah, I got it. Yeah, yeah, I got it. Go straight. Yeah, yeah, I got it. Be more careful. Got it on the next one. Thanks. The visuals in Crazy Taxi are fairly impressive even now. Your immediate environment is large and loaded with cars, people, and businesses. You'll recognize popular locations like the KFC and Pizza Hut, as well as numerous fictional destinations like churches and amusement parks. The nice thing is, is that the performance always targets 60 frames per second. While it does hit some snags with slowdown in spots, it's overall fast and very smooth. It gave a great feeling of an arcade game at home, and there was nothing on the PlayStation or Nintendo 64 anywhere close to it. But as much as I was impressed by the visuals, it had one flaw that really stuck out. Geometry pop-in. 
At any given time, there are cars, buildings, and other details popping up in plain view. The worst of it sees massive chunks of the road appearing out of thin air. Polygon Pop-In was always in the original Naomi Arcade version, but here, it seems a bit more noticeable. This really is the only blemish on an otherwise impressive showing, however. Playing this in early 2000 on a home console was nothing short of spectacular. The models, performance, textures, and the amount of stuff on the screen absolutely killed anything available at home during the same time period. Sega had promised the arcade at home with the Dreamcast, and Crazy Taxi delivered on that promise while adding even more content to enjoy. Yeah, I think that was too dangerous. Crazy Taxi had a number of licensed music tracks from multiple bands. This sound made the game as much as anything else. I'd love to let you hear some of it without commentary, but that would garner me a copyright claim for sure. The best I can do is to continue this video with the volume slightly higher than usual so you can get a good idea of what's here. Ready? Go! When AM3 made Crazy Taxi for the arcade, it was meant to be played in short intervals, so the gameplay was quite fun and exciting. I mean, three or four minutes of gameplay here and there was more than enough to enjoy crashing around the city and enjoying its sights and sounds. Of course, once it came home, the single map and the one-note gameplay really wasn't going to hold up. The extra map really added some much-needed variety to things. Not only is it larger, but it has a few nice touches you can find if you explore around a bit. The Crazy Box offers those of you that want to master the controls something to really sink your teeth into. While completing these events aren't tough, mastering them is something else entirely. You can waste hours trying to get the top score, and score really becomes the main reason to play the entire game. Whether it's getting the most fair and the highest license in the arcade style modes or getting the best times and scores in the crazy box, your goal here is to leave your mark in the rankings. The big question is, is that enough for you? Do you care enough about scoring to spend the time you'll need to get good? It's true you can still have fun with Crazy Taxi just roaming the city and driving passengers to their destinations but any long-term play is most certainly centered on the scoring systems at play. Should that not mean much to you, Crazy Taxi may be short-lived. Even with two areas to race around, the core arcade gameplay does get old after a while. The Crazy Box helps, but you'll need to learn the higher functions of the gameplay to get the most out of it. It's still very much a game for arcade enthusiasts looking for that pick-up-and-play appeal Sega was so well-known for. Those looking for tons of unlockable cars, characters, customizations, or similar content will likely come away severely disappointed. Let's go. The start of the sixth generation of consoles was magical. While the Saturn, PlayStation, and Nintendo 64 had begun to bring the arcade home on an unprecedented level, the Dreamcast delivered it almost pixel perfect in ways we had never seen before. And this was before the PlayStation 2, GameCube, and Xbox had shown up, so it felt kinda special that you could only obtain that level of play on your console of choice. Along with Crazy Taxi, other Naomi-powered Dreamcast ports like The House of the Dead 2, Power Stone, and Zombie Revenge really hammered home just how far ahead Sega was in 1999. You were seeing a caliber of graphics that were so far ahead of the other home options, the Dreamcast really did feel like you owned a legit arcade system reminiscent of the Neo Geo. When Sega left the console market in 2001, they were sure to get Crazy Taxi on other platforms. You can pretty much play it anywhere, including the PC, PlayStation 2, and GameCube. 
It was popular enough to get multiple sequels, and it was even copied a few times by other developers. Most modern versions available have the licensed music stripped out of it so it doesn't feel quite right, so falling back on one of these original releases is often the way to go. Whenever I see Crazy Taxi, it transports me back to a time when the Dreamcast was state-of-the-art and owning one gave me that feeling of arcade perfection that I had craved for years. From late 1998 to 2002, the Dreamcast was the center of my gaming universe, and no amount of negativity from how things ended up could change that. Sometimes the best memories aren't about the destination, but rather the trip getting there. And for me, Crazy Taxi was one heck of a ride. I'm Sigalord X, thank you guys for watching, and I will catch you next time.